Today's reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 48. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to those who are watching online, whether now or later on. It's great to be here in God's presence this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless each one of us this morning through your word, through the teaching of your word, and through your Holy Spirit, that we may each understand more what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us and what you want to do in our lives through your Holy Spirit. And as we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, my question this morning is, does God show favoritism? In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord Jesus told his closest followers that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And in Matthew 28, verse 19, (coughs) the Lord Jesus commanded the 11 remaining apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. (coughs) Excuse me a minute. This teaching was consistent with the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 18, that through Abraham and his offspring, or seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. But surely, the Jewish people remained God's special people, God's favorites, or did they? But first, some background uh, to this passage. In the early chapters of Acts, we see the commandment of Jesus unfolding. The ministry had started in Jerusalem, but the church had been scattered due to persecution. The scattered Christians took the message with them to Judea and Samaria, 
And Philip the Evangelist had a tremendous ministry in Samaria, and many Samaritans believed. And when the apostles went to Samaria and laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, the Samaritans weren't exactly Jews, but they were pretty close to being Jews. And then, of course, the same Philip had met the Ethiopian eunuch, who had been converted and baptised. Well, Peter was in Joppa, which is on the seashore of the Mediterranean, on the roof of the house of Simon the Tanner's place, and one day, just before lunch, he had fallen into a kind of spiritual trance, and three times he had seen a sheet let down from heaven to earth with all sorts of animals in it, including those which he, as a good Jew, should not eat. And he had heard the command to get up and kill and eat. And each time, Peter had protested to the voice. Although he clearly thought it came from God, surely not, Lord. But then, eventually, the voice had told him, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Well, what was Peter to make of that? He was still thinking about that when he was told by the Spirit that three men were looking for him and that he should not hesitate to go with them, for God had sent them. So Peter greeted them, and they told him an extraordinary story about Cornelius, a good and God-fearing Roman centurion from the Italian regiment who had received a visit from an angel who had told Cornelius that his prayers and gifts to the poor had been noticed by God and that he should send some of his men to find and bring back Simon Peter, who was staying at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa. So, Peter and some Christian friends went with the men, and when he arrived, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Perhaps he thought uh, this was another angel turned up. But anyway, Peter had to tell him, no, 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 I'm just a man. Don't do that. And then Peter found that there was a large gathering of people inside who had come to hear him. It wasn't just Cornelius, it wasn't just Cornelius' family, it's lots and lots of his friends all gathered in what must presumably have been a big house. And Peter told Cornelius about the vision which he'd received and what the Holy Spirit had said to him. Well, Peter starts his message. And he starts by declaring that he now understands that God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Now, that was a very big step in Peter's understanding. He was a Jew, a good Jew, and Jews didn't associate with that rabble, the, 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 uh, the non-Jews. And from his youngest days, he had been taught that the Jews were God's special chosen people, his favourites, and all the others were outsiders. Everything which he'd been taught as a boy and had believed had pointed in that direction, although Jesus had challenged that. Jesus once said that he had not found greater faith anywhere in Israel than he found in a Roman centurion in Capernaum. And Jesus had healed and delivered people who were not Jews. Peter then begins to speak to the people there about Jesus, about the ministry of Jesus in Galilee and Judea, about his healing and deliverance ministry, about his teaching and preaching ministry, and about his death on a tree, which, by which he means the cross. And then Peter went on to speak about the resurrection of Jesus. He and others are eyewitnesses of this. He and others ate and drank with Jesus after the resurrection. And Jesus had told them to preach that he was the one whom God had appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Those who believed in Jesus received forgiveness of sins. 
Well, Peter's in full flow by now. But he hasn't yet called upon them to repent and believe as he did in his great sermon on the day of Pentecost when something extraordinary also happened. But at that very moment, something totally unexpected happened. See, there's nothing wrong with Peter's talk. It's very good. It's very powerful. It's very accurate. But I believe that God wanted to make it clear to Peter and to other believers with him that God alone was doing something extraordinary that day. For even whilst Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit intervened and filled everyone of Cornelius' household and friends who were present there. Cornelius, Cornelius' family, Cornelius' servants, Cornelius' friends, everyone, irrespective of whether they were Romans or Jews or Greeks or anything else. And there were outward signs of them speaking in tongues and praising God. You see exactly what had happened before on the day of Pentecost for the Jews was now happening in Cornelius' house for the Gentiles. Well, those uh, believers, those Jewish believers who come with Peter were just absolutely astonished. What's going on? What is God doing? But Peter immediately realized the importance of what had happened. This was something new, something very exciting, and God was doing it. If Gentiles could believe in Jesus, if Gentiles could receive forgiveness of sins, if Gentiles had been filled with the Holy Spirit, if Gentiles have received the spiritual gift of tongues, then they are the same as Jewish Christians. God has accepted them and blessed them just as he blessed the Jewish Christians. That's what Peter is thinking. And if that is so, then there's no reason why they should not be baptized and received as full members of the body of Christ, the church. So, Peter says, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? Well, the answer is obviously no. They have been filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit, so why not also with water? And they were. And that day, a new local church came to being called the church which meets at Cornelius' house. Finally, they needed more teaching. And so Peter and his friends stayed with them for a few days in order to give them more teaching as to how they should live as believers. Well, what are we to make of this? I want you first to note who wrote down this account. The writer is Luke, a doctor who was a companion of Paul on his second missionary journey. And Luke was not a Jew, he's a Greek. I think, I'm struggling to, just to, to think about this, but I think he's the only non-Jew who writes in the New Testament. Isn't that exciting? How precious the story must have been to Luke and how precious it is to us who are also Gentiles. The second thing which I want you to note is the hand of God at work. God noticed Cornelius. God sent his angel to Cornelius, gave him precise instructions where to find Peter. But to make absolutely sure that nothing went wrong, God was working at the other end as well, preparing Peter for this event with the vision of the animals. You see, that vision had nothing to do with what food Peter should eat. Those whom Peter must not call impure were not pigs or shellfish. They were people. They were people who happened to not be Jews, but whom God was about to make spiritually clean. And to make even surer, the Holy Spirit even told Peter who the men were, why they were looking for him, and that he must go with them. God is in charge of every detail here. So does God show favoritism? 
Well, God has always had a special place in his heart for the descendants of Abraham, and particularly for the descendants of Isaac and Jacob, who, who God changed his name to Israel, because he entered into special covenants, agreements with them and with their descendants. I believe that God has always had an especial role for the Jewish people to be the means through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. And that's why Jesus, the Messiah, came, the Son of God, came as a Jew to be that very same means. But God offers the same forgiveness, the same new life, the same filling with the Holy Spirit, the same adoption into his family to all who believe. Not that he loves Jews less, it's that he loves us equally with them if we repent of our sins and believe in his son Jesus. In fact, he loves us more than those Jews who don't repent and believe in his son Jesus. In a sense, you see, he shows favoritism to all who believe in Jesus, making us his sons, even you ladies. Well, I had a discussion with uh, a, a young person. Uh, uh, Joel, Joel challenged me on, uh, at the AGM about talking to uh, young people about what they've been learning in a youth group. So I spoke to one of them. I'm not going to say who it was. It's not one of those who comes to, to St. Paul's regularly. And I had a really useful conversation. But during that conversation, I understood that this particular person didn't understand the vital importance of faith and commitment to Jesus. She thought that God's love, mercy, all, all the things he promises were for everybody. And I had to say, no, 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 no. You've misunderstood that. There is a narrow gateway into the blessings of God. And that gateway is through faith, through repentance, and through faith. And that's essential that people understand that. So anyway, I think she understood that. Oh, I just revealed it was, a, it was a girl. That was a mistake. <laughs> what can we learn from this passage? The first thing is that the Church of God is open to all, irrespective of race or nationality or language or gender. That is what Peter and those Christians with him had to learn from this experience. There were to be no first-class Christians and second-class Christians in the kingdom of God. And that's what we learn from the book of Revelations. And here's a, a quotation. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. That is what the whole church of God looks like. And I'm very glad that St. Paul's Church is a small demonstration of that because we have many people of different nationalities. As I look out at the congregation, I can see people from many different nations, tribes, peoples, and languages. And I rejoice in that. And just to make it absolutely clear to me that this was important, uh, the two people at the door this morning greeting uh, were people whose skin colour indicates that their ancestors came from somewhat hotter places than, than Jersey. And the last six people to receive communion also had darker skin colour than, than I have. So I think God was saying something to me through those coincidences, although I was already going to say what I've already said. I'm glad that St Paul's Church is a demonstration, a small demonstration of this. And that means that Christians of other nations, of every other nation, uh, even Guernseyman, <laughs> are of equal value. I've got many good friends in Guernsey, I just said that, that uh, to the side. Uh, are of equal value to the Lord. He loves us all because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And he wants us to value each other equally. Paul mentioned at the AGM that St Paul was in a privileged situation because we had links with Christians all over the world in particularly important strategic positions. 
The second thing which we can learn is that God wants us to do something for him. If he wants us to do something for him, then he will make it clear. The Lord took no chances that Peter would refuse to go to the house of Cornelius. Now, often Christians struggle to know what the Lord wants them to do, and even worry that they may not hear correctly. The truth is that most of us are pretty deaf. Like me, without my hearing aids. And if the Lord really wants us to do something for him, very often he has to repeat it to us. And he will repeat it to us. Don't worry, you won't hear him once. He'll keep on talking to you. But sometimes, because we're so spiritually deaf, we need to turn up the volume. <laughs> Which I have to do from time to time. Thirdly, this passage is very much about the sovereign purposes of God. He was in what happened at every stage. He didn't even wait for the end of Peter's talk before he poured out the Holy Spirit on those who believed. It was a repeat for the Gentiles of what happened on the day of Pentecost for the apostles and the Jews. Never doubt that God will ultimately work out his purposes despite the opposition of the devil and his gang and the opposition of the world of people living in rebellion against the Lord. Now that's how far I got in my preparation. And then this morning I suddenly realized I was completely missing the biggest point of the story. So I've got a fourth thing that we can learn from this. And that is this, and this I think is the most important thing. The same in filling and spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, which were available to the apostles, which were poured out on the Gentiles on this day, are available to us today. The Holy Spirit can still be poured out today on all who believe. So if you have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit, if you do not know the sense of God's loving presence powerfully in your life, then you don't need to wait for the day of Pentecost. For that, you can open your hearts and your lives to Jesus, and he will come in through the Holy Spirit. I want to conclude with some words of praise and worship. So here is what that great crowd from every nation, tribe, people, and language are saying in heaven. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And here's the response in heaven of the holy angels and elders and others around the throne. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And we can join with them in saying, Amen.